Good evening. It is time to begin our worship services this evening. We want to welcome each and every one. We're glad that you chose to worship with us here at Bobby Branch Church of Christ, as well as those who may be viewing us Facebook Live or watching this as recorded through YouTube or on Ben Loman Channel 6. We're glad that you're viewing our services. We want to encourage all of you. We are open and have in-person services. Our Sunday morning service is at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning. We have a Bible study that follows at 1015. And, of course, on Sunday evenings, we have a 6 p.m. worship service as well. We also have a Wednesday evening Bible study that begins at 7. As we begin our service tonight and prepare our minds for worship, if you would, if you want to go ahead and mark our scripture, midi, our scripture reading this evening will be Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 11.30 will be the scripture reading. If you are here visiting, we would ask if you would please fill out one of the visitor's cards. Once you've done that, if you would please leave that on the pew, and those will be collected following services. We want to go through our sick list and just update um, some updates from this morning. Zion's cold sway they rain over land and sea bidding us look to realms above while the light from the throne shines for you and me let us sit to the call of love Zion's
we'll sing one tune four of We Will Glorify. <clears throat> He will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come before thee at this time thanking you for all the many blessings of this day and this life, for all the undying love that you give for us, all that you take care of us without us even knowing it, and with what we do need in this life. We thank you for your Son Jesus, whom you gave to die upon the cross for our many sins. We ask that you be with us during this service and let all things be found worthy of thy name as we worship tonight. May you be with Brother Tony as he portrays the lesson to us and let it fall on good and earnest hearts and help us to be stronger and more faithful to thee. We ask that you be with those who are sick and in need, dear Lord, to watch over them, to help them and help the caregivers. We ask that you continue to be with all that we're not aware of and those that we do. We ask that you be with the elders of our congregation to give them the wisdom and strength that they need in the things and decisions that they make to help us and lead us in our ways. We ask, dearly and Father, that you go with us throughout this service as we ask this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. The invitation song this evening will be 667, 667. But before the lesson, we'll sing Faith is a Victory. <clears throat> And camped along the hills of life, the Christian soldiers rise and press the battle.
I'll be reading Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. I announced a few weeks ago, and then I announced this morning, that tonight's lesson was going to be a little different from our normal plan, that I'm going to be a teaching about doing soul winning, and there's two purposes in mind. The first is to make sure that we teach God's Word to those who may not know it. The lessons that we preach here and all of our services go into all the world goes into foreign countries, it goes overseas. Many people will make comments on Facebook and on YouTube about how much they enjoy the lessons and how much they enjoy the worship service. And we have to realize that we may be able to go into someone's home to teach them the gospel by means of this, as well as being able to go into their homes personally. Also, I have been told many times Tony, I'd love to teach a home Bible study, but I just don't know how. I don't know how to take the Bible and open and study with people. And there's a three-lesson set of lessons to teach a home Bible study. I've got a, several of them in my hand. I'm going to take them with me to the back when I go tonight. If you want to teach a home Bible study, you've got someone in mind, please come up and say, can I have one of those? And we'll provide all that you need. But what my plans are for the next three weeks, tonight, the 25th, and then the first Sunday night of October, is for us to deal with these three lessons. And so I will begin, winning souls is wise. Brother Talon just read to us from Proverbs 11 to verse 30, he who wins souls is a wise person because you are saving a precious soul from hell. I think we need to understand how bad hell is and how terrible it is, and we don't want anyone to go there. You're also securing a place for that precious soul in heaven with God. It's not just you're avoiding the bad things, but you're going to allow that person to enjoy the blessings of what will be in heaven. But number three, something that I think many of us have discussed, and that is, what is the future of the church at Bobby Branch going to look like? As some of us whose hair is white pass from this life and there comes a new generation, what will the congregation look like? Folks, we have to be able to, to sustain the church by teaching those who are not Christians to become Christians. And then it also safeguards our own soul. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Folks, that ought to make us shudder to think about how many people we meet, how many people we have influence over. Do we ever say anything to them about the future and about the Bible and about the hereafter? We all have a commission. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. But we also have compassion. Matthew 9 and verse 26 tells us that when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like a sheep having no shepherd. I would tell you that's 2022 in McMinnville, Tennessee right now. People are scattered. People are wandering. They need direction. They need guidance. They need God's word. Matthew 16 and verse 26 what profit is a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? People are living for the money that they're going to make, for the lifestyle that they can enjoy. But when it gets to the end of life, what's really going to matter to them? We must also have the correct answer. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, But sanctifying the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give defense, or if you're reading the original King James, answer to every man that asks the reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 
We read in Romans 10, 1 through 3, as we've studied on Sunday morning several times, there are people who have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And we have to have the courage to go. We read in Isaiah 6 and verse 8, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. We've got to be the person ready to take it. Now, I will tell you that each of these lessons have 20 questions to it. And the way that it is organized is you will have a scripture. And you and the person sitting there reading together... In fact, let the person whom you are studying with read the scripture out of their Bible. And then there's usually one or two questions that will follow it. And then there's an actual worksheet that you leave with the person that's called, has in it what's called a ladder that shows you the steps of salvation. So let's begin. First one will be question number one. And question number one begins with the reading 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue. Notice the emphasis on that. And the first question that you ask after having read that is, has God given us everything that we need for life and godliness? Well, if you just read that verse, you know immediately you're going to circle, yes, God's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, everything that we need. The second question is also very important because it will come into play later as you study. Since all has been provided, do you need additional information other than the Bible? Can a person... Simply take the Bible, learn what God says, let it direct your life. Well, if his divine power is granted unto us all of this, then the answer has got to be yes. That leads to question number two. And the text that you read is Ephesians 2 and verse 15 and Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. And here's what Paul writes to those two churches. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, That is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two and thus making peace. The parallel to that in Colossians chapter 2 says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And so the first question that pops up is, has God abolished the law with its commandments and regulations? Well, if you read verse 14 of Ephesians 2, you've got to say, yes, he did. Because that's the very words that he used. And the second question that goes with that, were the handwritten ordinances, that is the Ten Commandments, because that's what was written with the very finger of God, been taken out of the way at the time Jesus died on the cross. That's exactly what Colossians 2 verse 14 says. So if you're studying along and you're you're reading the passage and you're circling the words, you've got to say yes. And if a person doesn't understand, you go back and you read the verse again. Question number three, Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 6 and 7. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Now you listen to those words carefully. And then you answer the question, does God contrast the two covenants the law of Moses, and the New Testament of Christ. If you read that, it's obvious there's there's two covenants there and they're being contrasted with one another. And the second question that follows up with that is, if nothing had been wrong with the law of Moses, would God have replaced it with the law of Christ? You see, verse 7 says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second one. 
And so you've got to answer these questions here again. Yes, he's contrasting the two covenants, and the old covenant had fault, and it had to be replaced. Question number four from Romans 7, verses 6 and 7. But now we have been delivered from the law, having to die to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the letter, our spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, he talks about being delivered here in verse 7 or verse 6. So the first question is, are you delivered, that is, discharged, released from the law? Well, if Paul says we were, then we have to say, yes, we were. Number two, since you are released from the law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, should you serve that law? Well, you should not serve that law. And you might say, well, why are we following this pattern? It's because you're leading a person through God's word to see the role of what law we are under. Now, that brings us to question number five. And I would dare say it's probably too small for everybody beyond the third pew to read this. But it says, study and complete this chart. Mark through the laws not in effect today. And what it does, it takes the laws of various countries, and you may or may not be familiar with some of these, but like the country of Argentina, this is in the the little pamphlet here. The earlier rule was by Indians. I would probably say we'd use a more correct term, say Native Americans today. But then after that, they were ruled by Spain, and now they're ruled as a republic. Or the country of Australia, the Aborigines were the ones who originally ruled there. Then you had England, and now they have a constitutional monarchy. Canada was a rule by Native Americans, then by England, and now they're a constitutional monarchy. Germany was ruled by the crown of Germany, then the Third Reich by Hitler, and now they are a republic. Or India was ruled first by France, and then they were ruled by England, and now they are a republic. And you see, in each of these, you're supposed to mark out the laws which no longer apply. Well, if you would say, if you lived in India, would France be your ruler? No. Would England be your ruler? No. The current law. And let's just jump down to the United States. You had first Native Americans here with their tribes and the ones who ruled in the various parts of the country. And then England became the country which had control over the colonies. But now we live under a constitutional republic. Should we be guided by the rules and regulations of England? Well, no, because we're no longer under that law. Well, if you'll notice right under that, it says your country, depending upon where the person is studying, What rule has been in your country in the past, and who is the rule today? What the purpose of this is, is to take someone and show them that at the beginning, men and women were under a patriarchal system where God dealt with the heads of the fathers, the heads of the families. And that's the way for many years God dealt with men. But then was the law of Moses contained in laws and ordinances, which also involved the Ten Commandments. However, we're not under the patriarchal system now. We're not under the Mosaic system now. We're under the law of Christ. So questions one through five are to lead you to understand what law we are under. Question number six. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, or correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the first question is, since the scriptures make known the will of God to thoroughly equip, that is to furnish you for every good work, do you need other revelations to make you complete spiritually. Now that's also a significant move in the study because you've contrasted the Old 
Testament and the New Testament given by God. And to point out, we now live under the New Testament. But you're given this passage now, and it's clear that the emphasis is on, what about other revelations? What about someone else who claims to have another testament of Jesus Christ? What if someone comes up with another law? Well, this one says that this is thoroughly, completely, fully furnishing you. Is it your understanding that the New Testament is the law now spiritually binding? Well, a person would have to say, yeah, that's what it is. There's no other option that you can rationally choose. Well, that leads me to uh, the next one, John chapter 12, verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, um, the yes and no question, will the words of Jesus judge you in the last day rather than the words of the commandments of Moses or others? And if you start looking, you'll start noticing a pattern developing here that the scriptures teach that we are under the law of Christ and we're obligated to obey it. But John 10, verse 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. That's Jesus speaking. Well, did Jesus come so that you could have a full and abundant life now as well as eternity? Well, the answer has to be yes, because Jesus wants me to be happy here. He wants me to be fulfilled here. He wants me to be what I ought to be here. The next is John 14, verse 6 from question number 9. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. Now, the question that follows is, since Jesus said he came to give a full and abundant life, should you go to Jesus' words, that is his teaching, to learn the way to have life? Well, you'd have to say, well, yes, you have to do that. Could the words which of these people give you an abundant life? Mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, friends, or neighbors? And here's where a person may have to say, well, I think they can help us. But when you're talking about a true abundant life, it's only the words, no one can come unto the Father except through me. Could the words of these people give you an abundant life? Joseph Smith, John Calvin, Martin Luther, John and Charles Wesley, John Knox, or the Pope? Can their words be what gives you what you need to have an abundant life? And if you read John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You've got to go to the Father through him. Which question number 10 leads us to Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate that broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The question that comes up, will the majority enter heaven? And you got to say, no, they won't. Because Jesus said that the majority are on the road to destruction. Well, is the majority a safe guide for your spiritual life? Well, you'd have to say, well, if the majority are going to go into destruction, then they surely can't be a safe guide. Yet so many people will say, you know, if, if that's what everybody else believes we ought to do, maybe we, that's what we ought to do. And now a very significant question. Do you want to go to heaven? And I believe everybody has to say, well, yes, I want to go to heaven. If you're a person who has any sense at all, you'd say, I want to go to heaven. I want to be where God is. Well, let's go to chapter 7 and verses 21 through verse 23. And when you get there, this is where it's going to lead to our worksheet now. 
He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then he will declare to them, I never knew you. You who depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so the question is risen. Since Jesus came to give a full and abundant life, should you go to Jesus to learn the way to have that life? Oh, yes. Did Jesus say that you could enter heaven by doing the will of man? No, you can't do that. Could Jesus say, depart from me, even if you are, now listen carefully, sincere and say, Lord, Lord, and do many good works? Now, folks, that's, that's a question that is very significant. Because if you come to this point and you've read all these scriptures, you have to be forced to say, I can say Lord, Lord and not be on my way to heaven. It's a very significant point in a person's life. Now, when you go to the ladder, one of the things that you will notice is that the ladder shows, which is, looks different on the screen than it does down here, uh, but you'll notice the ladder has two sides to it. The two sides involve both the grace of God and his obedience that he expects from man, and that both of them have to be together. And you start at the bottom in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 tells you that Jesus is the foundation. That's where you've got to start in all of this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28 now. Look at question number 12, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And the question that comes up, did Jesus say you could observe part of his will and still be pleased to him? He said, command them to observe all things that I have told you. Is it your understanding that you must do all the will of God to please him? An answer must again be yes, because that's what we're to be taught. Question number 13, you get to John 3 and verse 16. You can quote this passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, is it God's will that you believe in Jesus? Well, that has to be yes. That's what God wants you to do. And so, if you look at the ladder now, you have at the foundation Jesus, but the very first step that you take is to believe. And so, that person, you let them write it on that piece of paper there. You look at each of these steps. What is that first step that he expects you to do? John 3, 16. <laughs> Well, John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so is it possible to enter heaven if you do not believe in Jesus Christ? No, I can't go there if I don't believe that he's the Son of God. Now what that does, that leads us to another part of the worksheet that now asks the person, and in this case, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, have you ever made a commitment to Christ? If so, how old were you? And I'd ask you, those of you who are Christians already, to go ahead and think in your mind how you would put that. Did you make a confession at the time of your commitment? What did you confess? What would you put down there? Did the preacher ask, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Number three, have you been baptized? How were you baptized? Can you remember the day you were baptized and remember what events took place? Number four, how long after your commitment were you baptized? Did it take so immediately or was it a month or six months later? For what purpose were you baptized? Now, at this point, before you've gone any further, we've not talked about baptism, but the person can write down here the reason for which they were baptized. Number six, were you saved before or after you were baptized? 
That's going to be a significant question when we get to lesson number two. But at this point, you have a person making an observation of looking back at who they were and what they did. Question number 15. John 14, verse 15, Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. If you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 27, uh, 22, 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So the question is, is it God's will that you believe in Christ and love him? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you do not obey Christ, do you love him? Can you claim to love Christ if you have not obeyed what he told you to do? And I don't think you can. So you got to answer no. And then you look on the ladder and you'll begin at the bottom with Jesus being the foundation. Believing is the next step. We've already observed that. Now love. You've got to believe the Lord and you've got to love him. Romans 6 and verse 17 for question number 16 is, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now the question that arises, when you obey God, can you obey only from an outward expression and not from the heart? He said, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that form of teaching. The second question, when you obey God, must you obey God's form of teaching? And then you're going to have to talk about that form of teaching at some point in the future. But you understand here that that's a part of it. Question number 17, we're getting very near the end. Luke 13, verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In addition to belief and love, is it God's will that you repent? Well, if you read that verse, you've got to say, obviously, we've got to repent. Will you receive a full and abundant life if you do not repent? That's a require some thought now because if all the blessings are in Jesus, Everything he's given, and he tells us, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. Well, I can't enjoy the abundant life unless I repent. And so as I'm looking on the ladder, the steps, believe, love, and now repent goes on that ladder. Question number 18. Acts 3, verse 19, 2 Corinthians 7, and verse 10. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And so the questions that follow, does repentance mean stopping sinning and turning to God instead of sorrow alone? Now, 2 Corinthians 7.10 will make that very abundant and very clear that a person can just have sorrow, but it's got to be godly sorrow. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be a change of mind and a change of action. Now, in the worksheet, there's a cross there, and there's little lines going across it. And it says, use it, OBS 118, 24, and 315. Will this help you place the guilt of your sins on Jesus? And they encourage them, write some of your sins that you've committed there. This is their worksheet. Let them do this themselves. But if you want to look on that sheet, you might say gossip. You might say uh, hatred. You might say uh, cheating. There may be several sins that a person could put on there of sins they've committed to realize that it is the cross of Christ, it is the blood that he shed that's going to forgive them of their sins. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father and who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father in heaven. In addition to belief, love, and repentance, is it God's will that you should acknowledge or confess Christ before men? Second 
thing you will notice is you go up the ladder again. You have the foundation is Jesus. You have believing. You have love. You have repentance. And now you have confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Last question. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be slay, saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The questions that arise, will you be saved if you do not confess Jesus with your mouth before men? If you read what was just read to you, you'll have to say, no, I can't be saved unless I confess Jesus. You see, the goal of the open Bible study, what we have right here, each of these lessons, and you just went through lesson one. I don't think any of us would have any difficulty reading those passages and just letting the person answer the question for themselves because the idea is to let God's word speak for itself. You don't need somebody to tell you what to believe. You need someone to lead you through the scriptures to believe what they themselves say. And thus one is converted or convicted and converted by the word of God and not by the opinions of men. They can't say, well, where did you get that doctrine? Well, that comes from the scriptures. That comes from God's word. Now, there are steps along the way to conversion, and it's not wise to skip any of them. And what you've seen already on the ladder is we started with the foundation of Jesus with belief and then love and then repentance and then confession. Now, that's as far as lesson one will take you. Lesson two will pick up where lesson one ends. And the next step is obedience, which involves baptism. And someone says, well, why didn't you get that into lesson one? Because you have to allow a person's mind to be wrapped around what Scripture says. To allow them to see the steps of salvation. To allow them to see it's the law of Christ that guides them. And not the opinions, not the words of men, or not even the Old Testament. But the New Testament of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you are here this evening and you're ready to be baptized. Maybe you've already studied through everything we've discussed and much more. And you know now, I want to become a Christian. Well, let me encourage you to do that. Maybe you're a Christian. You've got sin in your life. It's still the blood of Jesus that washes away your sins. But now your obligation is to come back and to be restored to faithfulness to him. We're going to sing, there's power in the blood. If you need to respond tonight, would you come as together we stand and sing?
If you have not had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper and to give of your means, if you want to continue that part of your worship, please make your way to the back of the auditorium and to the first room on the left back there when you go through the doors. That's been left prepared for you, and brethren will assist you with that. Thank you again for being here this evening. We appreciate you. If you're visiting with us, we appreciate you. We want you to come back if you can. Let's all remember that Wednesday evening we'll have our midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock. And remember to uh, uh, do what you can for the ones that are sick and shut in and send them cards. And visitation group 3 meets tonight. So don't forget that. Visitation group 3. Don't forget your meeting. Now Brother Paul is going to lead us in this final song and we'll be dismissed with a prayer. First and last verse. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. so much for the wonderful feasts on your word that we've had today. Father, we pray that you will be with us as we live our daily lives, that we might take the things that we learn here, Father, and use them daily. Father, especially the lesson that we learned tonight, please help us to see the obligation, the, the uh, privilege that we have of taking your word to other people. And we pray, Father, that as we do so, that we will be uh, people who live your word out in our lives so that we will not do anything to uh, bring harm or reproach on your word and on the church as we attempt to spread it to other people and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>